And we've got to be really good at what we do. And the things that we're not as good at, let's don't do those anymore, and let's just focus on what we can be great at, what we can be the best at. I mean, isn't any, for any business, isn't there a mission that should be to be the best at what we do? I mean, real simple. I know people come up with a lot of fancy mission statements and stuff like that, even though mission statements are kind of passe these days, but still, to be the best at what you do. So that's what our goal is. We're kind of fanatics about being the best at what we do. But so we started building restaurants like this with very focused menu. And it started changing things. And one of the other things is whatever, if you're in a consumer-facing business, retail, um, restaurant, you need, to, you need to ceaselessly work on your economic model, OK? And so usually it's, it is um, profit per x. There's an equation in there. And so a denominator. And every business has got to figure that out, what, what works for them. Um, and so you've got to take it and you sit, figure out, where are we losing money, okay? What is a waste of our time? Are we selling some menu item because it's, it's a legacy item and yet it's not making us any money? I mean, if you're losing money because you're trying to take care of, you know, six customers a week, that's not good business. And we're in franchising. And so we've got a lot of stakeholders. I mean, not just us and the Dickey family and all the great team members that we have in our company, but we have our consumers. We want to offer them the best product. So the way we serve them the best is, is to focus on having fewer items and being the best at those items. But also, we have our franchise owners. And they've got to be making money. That is the absolute key. So we've taken our, our, our restaurants in more modern stores. We've scaled it down over the years. And we've taken it down to... Um, to, to six uh, meats and eight vegetables. Um, that worked. So we started opening a few stores in, um, in 2000, out of Texas in 2006, 2007, and we started getting, p picking up momentum. Then the recession came, all right? I want to tell you, about, just talk about that for a second, because your business has got to be long-term sustainable. Whatever you do in the business, you want to make sure that you add value. And obviously, the economy is cyclical. So you've got to be able to add value to your business. And your business has got to be able to thrive in good times and bad times. So when the economy hit, when the, when the recession hit the economy in Q4 um, 2008, and that was a tough time. That's when I started getting some gray hairs in my head, OK? Let me just tell you. And um, we, were, we, had a, we, we were starting to ramp up. And in fact, I'll tell you just aside real quick how, how much we had ramped up. I, I, I learned how to sell franchises. I learned how to really market franchises well um, in the 2006, 2007 period. I learned from people. I mean, I, I, I like to associate with people that are smarter than me, okay, and that know that are the subject matter experts. I know how to manage, and I know how to bring good people together, and I know how to see kind of across functionalities. But I like to get subject matter experts that know a lot more about their trade than I know. And then I learn from them. I learn enough. I don't need to know everything, but I need to learn enough. And so I can manage and put the pieces together. I partnered up with a guy that knew how to sell franchises. And he really understood the franchise sales development side of the business, which I didn't know so well. So we had gotten the best year that we'd ever had before I partnered up with a certain gentleman is, is uh, we'd open eight stores. Okay. 2006, we suddenly sold 80 stores. I'm like, holy shit, what happened? <laughs> I mean, like, what do we do with all that? Well, I knew I needed to start hiring people. I need to start getting ready to find real estate and start building all these stores and start cutting deals with equipment companies so I could build these stores outright. We had a lot of stores in development. And then the recession hit. And guess what happened? One of the things, everybody knows about the subprime meltdown um, on the residential side, but what a lot of people don't know as much about is that the same thing happened on the business side. There were business loans out there, especially 7A SBA loans all over the place. And people were taking these loans to start a business, whether it's an independent business or whether it's a franchise of any brand. And then, and so it's always contingent. There's always contingencies in these loan packages. And so a lot of people get their businesses under construction. And they're starting to, and they get it. I mean, there's hammer swinging. They're going. And then what happened? In late 2008, a lot of these people that had restaurants that were half built or leases signed, deposits paid, utility deposits paid, all of a sudden, boom, 
The rug gets yanked from right under them, and they can't build anymore. They have to stop construction. This is what's happening, okay? This is a mess, all right? And then the growth, the new growth stopped too. And so we found ourselves in a situation where it's like, oh my God. It's like, you know, everything is just suddenly halted, and what are we going to do? Plus, we've got a lot of folks out here that have got issues that their jobs have stopped, and they need to get the restaurants open. How are we going to do it? When you're talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of projects, that's a real issue. It was a real issue for us. And so we spent a lot of time taking just issue by issue and cleaning up and figuring out. But you know what they say, that which does not kill you makes you stronger? I mean, when the times are good, yeah, you learn things. But when the times are bad and you figure out how to get through the tough times and then go on and prosper, that's when you really learn. I mean, that's what puts hair on your chest, okay? And so um, we did. And in the summer of 2009, in July to be specific, we all read Good to Great. Anybody here a fan of Jim Collins, Good to Great? Anyone? Nobody? Oh, well, some of my team are. Because they all have to read the book, okay? And so, um, anyway, listen, I recommend you read it, that book. In fact, I'll tell you two books real fast, okay? Jim Collins, Good to Great. He's got a lot of books, and there's a lot of great books, and I would recommend you read all those books. Every book he's got. But if there was one out of his series of books, it's Good to Great. That's the one you should read. There's another, there's another book that you should read, okay? Especially as y'all that are going to be graduating from business school soon. A guy named Bob Pfeiffer. It is. How to Double Your Profits in Six Months, 78 Ways to Do It, okay? Bob Pfeiffer, Double Your Profits in Six Months, 78 Ways to Do It, okay? You read those two books together side by side, something magical happens. You talk about your business strategy and how you build a business, and then there's how to manage the details of your business for profitability, all right? So anyway, that's what we did. We read it, and one of the, one of the great things about Good to Great was that I, I used to go and give speeches and you know, talk from the platitudes about this and that. And, then, and, and I realized, what, what don't I know about business? And what's out there? And what is, what is kind of the, the secret formula, if you will? And I really I didn't know. But then I'm actually reading Good to Great. And I realized, it's like, you know what? That's not actually what the way to approach business. It should be get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, the right people in the right seats, and basically, who first, then what, okay? Who first, then what? What are you going to do? Because what happens if you're trying to build a, a business plan and you don't have people that are bought in? Or what if they're bought into a specific plan and then you want to be flexible and nimble and you want to adjust, but the people are bought into the original plan and they're not flexible and they won't get on board with something new? What, what our philosophy at Dickies is, get a, just get a great team. I mean, get a good team, okay? And I know it sounds like common sense, right? And I really believe in common sense. What did Mark Twain say? Common sense ain't so common? Well, get a great team around you that believe, that all have the same mission, that are easy to work with. It sucks working with people that you don't want to work with. And you, and you spend energy dealing with people. You need to build trust, build synergies, all that stuff. And then y'all can decide where to go or where to drive the bus. And that's what we believe in Dickies. And so you try a lot of things. Not everything's going to work. But, you know, we've never been, we've never penalized a single employee ever for working in good faith, eagerly, to drive that person's part of the business forward and making a mistake, an honest mistake, and then working in good faith. That's never going to be a problem. That employee's never going to be penalized, OK? I'm not talking about careless. That's something different. I'm talking about good-hearted, working hard, made a mistake. Nobody's made more mistakes than I've made, okay?